A good day, everyone. I am Mark, your fat friend. And I'm James, your black friend. And this is the Fat and Black Connection. Where we talk about anything and everything. As long as it's interesting to us, of course. Absolutely. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about, well... Disney Plus's Encore. We've got our special guest, Brian Hobbs, who worked on the show, and he's going to be joining us. So that's going to be our primary focus today. Yeah. So remember, this show is 100% interactive, so your comments and questions are greatly appreciated. Absolutely. You know, we've got that comment box down there available for you. Please utilize it. Let us know how we're doing. If you've got questions for us, if you've got questions for Brian, um, type them in, let us see them, and we will uh, try to incorporate them to the best of our ability. Absolutely. As long as they're interesting to us, of course. Well, yeah, 100%. And, uh, you know, just a reminder, if you are uh, watching live right now and you feel like you might have missed any part of this episode, please go back and listen to the podcast. Uh, it's typically up within an hour or two of the show ending. So yeah, yeah. I do my best. I, I guess I could try and do better. But yeah. um, So, James, um, how are you? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. Got some good news earlier this week. Ooh, good news. What is yes. that? Uh, who has two thumbs and is getting a house? This guy. Wow. Yeah, man. Yeah. So are we talking about ownership or are we talking about you're moving into a house or what? Ownership, baby. Oh, my gosh. You're adulting. Start building that equity, baby. <laughs> yes, that, 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 is, uh, that is an important piece, equity. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just don't be one of those silly people who goes out and, you know, builds up a year or two's worth of equity and then takes a new loan. That's, that's not the way to go. So, okay, so you're getting a new house. Uh, yeah. Is this a new house or new to you? New house. Like we're talking ground up construction? and Yes, sir. Yes, oh. sir. A yes. And, and is this in Vegas? New, new. Wow, that's that's fantastic. And and so Henderson, Vegas, where where are we looking at? Uh yeah, so it's uh it's in Vegas. It's uh it's close to the uh M Resort, uh which is basically the furthest you can go and from the strip and and have a resort. Um it's like the first uh resort that you would hit as you enter Vegas if you're coming from uh the LA drive up. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. cool. And yeah. so so time frame? Uh, so um, it's looking like uh, I'll be moving into September, but uh, because of some setbacks they had. But if um, I will be in contact with um, uh, my contact over at, at the at the comp at the complex, and um, she will let me know if anything changes. So it could be earlier. Uh, the worst case, September. Worst case scenario, September. Yep. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, cool. Yeah. More good news that came out uh, this last week is, um, as we know, Disneyland is reopening in uh, 17 short days. Yes, um, those who already had tickets were able to go into the reservation mm -hmm. system as of yesterday to try and get their passes to go to the parks. Uh, tickets theoretically are going on sale in two days. New tickets for those that don't have it. Um, so... But going along with that is we have been informed that uh, at the Disneyland Resort, the Avengers Campus will be opening on June 30th at Disney's California Adventure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey question. Um, so with those uh, people that already had tickets, mm -hmm. are they out-of-state people or what's the deal? So uh, my understanding is if they're out of state people, uh, they are extending the longevity on how long the tickets can last. One, they're offering refunds to, um, and then they're also allowing, you know, people to wait because they're hoping that California will relax some of the restrictions in, in the near future. Uh, so am I, so are you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cause, uh, we're fully vaccinated. I'm two weeks beyond my second shot. So I am done. Like I, yeah. I, Hey, look, I got that money. I already got that money set aside, baby. I'm ready to go. Yes. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Yeah, it was it was very difficult for me to go to my boss and say, hey, I'm canceling my vacation time. <laughs> Disney's not letting me in. 
Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I still have the vacation time, which is nice. I'll just use yeah. it later. later um, yeah. yeah. I, so I, I don't know if you also saw, but there was a, a post, uh, I believe yesterday or the day before from Disney about some uh, updates and, and modifications they've made to the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, nothing I, major. I, nothing major. Nothing, yeah, nothing crazy. I was just, uh, I was looking at that and going, okay, that, that's interesting to see. I'm glad the uh, they took this time and, and, and they brought a couple, they brought a, I guess, I didn't realize that picture was gone. Of course, I haven't been in a while. Um, so uh, I think the last time I went to Disneyland was with you. So 2013. Yeah, I think that was the last time I was actually, or might have been another time, but but I think that might have been the last time that we went. So um, that I went with you especially. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see. Uh, I always like looking at the little graveyard thing because they always had some funny stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm interested to see what they did for that, and then um, just kind of see the inside again. It looks like they it looks like they added some uh, added some stuff, made it look a little bit more uh, alive, if you will. <laughs> a little bit more alive. The the exact opposite of what the haunted mansion is supposed to be. So, right. um, and and one other thing, you know playing on our childhood uh, that you may have seen uh, is that the CW is coming out with a new uh, live action Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, I don't know if you saw my comment on the uh, thing that you posted because I was like, what in the blue hell is this? And so uh, after I watched the Disney thing uh, for the Haunted Mansion, I went over and uh, was trying to find out what the heck was going on with the Powerpuff Girls. And and, uh, I'll give it a chance. Hey, look, any, I, I'm a I'm a huge fan of Donald Faison, and I heard he's going to be playing uh, Professor Professor Utonium. X. Yep. So I was like uh, Professor Utonium. So I was yep. like, okay. Any reason to see Donald Faison back on TV? I'm also, I uh, you know, I uh, I've learned to like D- Dove Cameron. Um, she's no Sophia Carson. Uh, that's Descendants stuff, but you don't worry about that. Um, and then um, and then uh, I can't remember her name, but the one who was uh, Daisy in Agents of Shield is apparently playing Blossom. So. I'm interested to kind of see uh, how this whole thing works. I'm not Absolutely. sure the one who was playing Buttercup. I don't know if I've seen her in anything or, but Broadway uh, actor. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So I'm interested to see uh, see what they do. I mean, you know, I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. I guess I'm, I I don't know really how I feel about it, but you know, like I said, I'm a fan of D- Donald Faison. I'm a fan of you know some of the actresses in that in the show. So. We'll give it a chance to see what's going on. I did find out that the narrator from the original show is going to be narrating for the uh, CW show, though. Nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> the city of Townsville. <laughs> yes, that will be good. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, it's this time of the show where I shamelessly plug uh, Secrets of Heritage House, the uh, the mystery uh, show that I am uh, doing some voiceover work for, which is premiering uh, very soon, Sunday, April 25th at 9 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on KNVC 95.1 FM up here in Northern Nevada. It comes on directly after Pop Culture Kaboom with a repeat broadcast on Friday the 30th at 8 p.m. It will then be available live via all your favorite podcast platforms starting on Saturday, May 1st. So if you're a podcast person, every Saturday starting May 1st for at least 13 weeks, uh, we will have new episodes coming out and you'll get to hear me uh, doing some fun voice acting. Yeah, I'm, and, excited to uh, hear, I'm excited to hear you do some, uh, do some voice stuff, man. I'm, I'm excited to see that. Or actually yeah. not he- see, but hear it. <laughs> yes, you will hear it. You will not see it. Unlike this show where you can see and hear us. All day, all day. Hey, uh, you know what? Coming up, got some big news. Yeah, got what's that? Big news. We have we we got another special guest coming in a couple. You know, in an upcoming episode, man. What? Yeah, Are, yeah, man. No, Are so you- he. Yeah, we will be interviewing a Southern California-based game designer who's worked with Blizzard. So that's like World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Diablo, um, and is currently working uh, with the company that puts out Ingress and Pokemon Go. So if you're, uh, oh, and also um, uh, Harry Potter Wizards Unite. Um, so we're going to be picking his brain, and we're going to see what's uh, if we can get some info on the next big thing coming. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that's huge. I mean, uh, Ingress, uh, I believe the company's Niantic and, uh, you know, Ingress was 
one of my favorite jams for a long time. Um, and, you know, the games that have come since then, Pokemon Go and Harry Potter Wizards Unite, those tend to be similar with just a different skin, so to speak. Um, yeah. yeah, so that'll be fun. When did you set that up? Oh, hey, man. <laughs> Things happen out here, baby. Things I guess. Out here. <laughs> I guess. So, uh, wow. Well, yeah. I, I definitely am looking forward to that. Um, yes, sir. But what I'm more looking forward to is today. Yes, sir. And, and we have uh, on the line a, a very uh, special guest, someone that you and I both know personally uh, and have worked with uh, in the past. And uh, the guy is fantastic. Uh, I... I directed West Side Story a number of years ago. James was my assistant director. And uh, Mr. Brian Hobbs was my musical director. I don't think I've worked with anyone better. Um, I don't think the theater company that we did that show with has ever had a better orchestra. Um, And so uh, the proof is in the pudding. And needless to say, I want to bring this guy in. His name is Brian Hobbs. I think he's out there. Brian, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hang on. Let me let me <laughs> let me turn this on here. Oh, okay. Well, it's good to know that the mic is working. So that's oh hey, we can there see you. There he oh, is. All right. Welcome. Right. And and I, I, I would like to take this opportunity to for your viewers to uh, to introduce to them the uh, the, the quarantine, the corn beard. Ah. <laughs> it's uh it's been a long time coming. Yeah, and so, uh, nobody's really seen this. I think you guys are the only ones who've seen this so far. But um, I, as I've told you, I think it's a good look. I think I it like works it. for you. I it's like a, it. it's a new look. It's definitely uh, it's definitely very different. I'm get, taking some getting used to it. I'm I'm learning how to take care of it and spending the time. Um, you might know that I don't exactly have a lot uh, going on in the hair department. So learning to take care of hair, it's a new thing for me. It's a new thing. <laughs> Well, it, it just transferred. What was on top has come yeah. down below. At least it didn't travel down too far, right? That's a good thing. Yeah, well. Um... <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, I know, I know these guys. I know these guys for a long time, and uh, and and they're they're a cut up. It's it's our experience has been great. And so uh, so, so, Bri- so Brian, hey Brian, how's it going? It's good to uh, good to have you on. <laughs> we uh yes. Yes, we, I, I don't want to steal too much thunder, but uh, we, we all did go to the same high school at different times. We weren't all there together. Um, right. we, we had a lot of similar experiences. Brian's post high school experiences, I think, are more amazing. Uh, and so I, I am definitely wanting to hear about that. And so let's, let's just dive on in, dive on in to the interview. And uh, my first question for you, in 10 minutes or less, Tell us who you are. Give us some background, uh, you know, that leads up to Disney Plus's Encore, because that's what we really want to get into. But give us everything up till then. I, I will get into that. But but first, there, there was one thing that I, I had to mention, and that is um, her name is Chloe Bennett. And, uh, and dude, James, you just spoiled S.H.I.E.L.D. <sighs> just, just going to say that. Anyone who has this, it's, it's, not an, it's not an old show. But yeah, you, you did. You did. It, it it has it had its season finale. What last year? Last year. So it's not that old. Series finale. <laughs> yeah, series series finale. It's yeah, but done. I didn't, but I didn't still, give, I didn't give anything away. I was just saying. All he said was that show. she was in it. Yeah. No, no, you gave away her name. Daisy. Yeah. You, you find just, that out in like, in like episode, episode two. Oh, uh, season three. <sighs> Whatever you're tripping. Anyway. Anyways, I'm just giving you a hard time because I can't. <laughs> get over it. <laughs> Tell us enough about of, yourself. Enough, of, enough about yeah. James. Tell us about you. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, uh, I got to say that um, professionally, I'm known by all three my all three of my names, Brian Allen Hobbs, because I found out very early on in my my music career that there was another Brian Hobbs. Um, who actually I think he's since passed away, but he was a he was a writer for theater. He was um, he was from the the Midwest or the the mid uh, mid Atlantic region somewhere. Um, he moved to Iceland, and, uh, and and so he had a he had a whole career there. So I, I figured that out early on and said, okay, so I'm going to go with the three names just because and it and it looks it looks pretty on a on a on a, a, a 
program sheet. Um, uh, what can I say? I, I figured out very early on in my musical theater career that um, I'm not a particularly good singer. I'm not a particularly good actor. Um, I'm an okay pianist. Um, but what I figured out early on is that uh, I know how to um, make all of my friends sound and look good on stage. And so I said, well, I guess I'm going to get into directing. Um, and so I got into directing early on. I was, I was directing my, I was, did my first musical directing as, as a freshman in high school. Oh. Um, yeah. So it's good, like ancient history. I have been doing this for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I d was directing a whole bunch of shows. I think I, I music directed, um, little shop of horrors like five times. Um, but uh, undergrad at UCLA studied music. I remember sitting down with my composition professor and I told him, okay, look, I want to write theater. I want to write show tunes. That's what I want to get into. And he said, great, I have nothing to teach you. <laughs> so that was like my first, my first experience, like figuring that I, I, I was on my own. I was figuring this out on my own. Uh, I've always figured everything out on my own. I've always planned, made my own path. I mean, my uh, my, my senior like composition thesis at UCLA uh, was I orchestrated a one act musical and we put it on. It was produced by uh, a little theater company that I'd worked with, and we did a bunch of shows. We did this little one act musical, um, and uh, and we put it on in in the and then then we also did a big huge production of Jesus Christ Superstar that summer. Um, that was kind of insane. Uh, I, let's see, I, I, I went to NYU for my master's degree and I studied at the Graduate Musical Theater Writing Program. Uh, there have been countless brilliant uh, artists in the theater who have come out of that program. I could name, uh, I could name a lot of obscure, small, off-Broadway shows that diehard theater fans might recognize. Uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with the details. Um, but the great thing about being at NYU, the great thing of being in New York City and this program that was founded basically by Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim uh, was that those people were around and gave us master classes. So I had Tony Kushner do a, a master class. I had Janine Tesori give a master class. Uh, Michael John Lacusa, uh, who is a, 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 a fantastic Broadway composer, uh, one of the author, the authors of one of the wild parties uh, was actually on faculty, as was William Finn, who wrote Falsettos and 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was rubbing shoulders with some good people, some interesting people. Uh, you know, I had a master class with Betty Comden and Adolph Green. Uh, I left NYU and started my, my, my venture, venture into the world of, of New York theater. and. Uh, Got nowhere fast. I there was one point when I had five part-time jobs and still couldn't pay my rent. <laughs> um, little small shows, uh, downtown, uh, late night cabaret, weird stuff. Um, I met a lot of interesting people, uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun times. But uh, my my big break was uh, I got a chance to to work on uh, the, the original Broadway production of Disney's Tarzan. I was recruited for that. Um, no, I was not recruited for that. I applied for that job. I applied for that job hard. Um, <laughs> I gave up a, a full-time job with health insurance and benefits to go work on Tarzan. Oh, that's uh, so scary. It, it, was, it was definitely like jumping off the deep end, but I tell you it was worth it. Um, it was a, a, a fantastic experience uh, because the show was opening cold on Broadway, no out of town tryout. Everything was in New York and we were working, we were rehearsing at the, uh, at the, 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 the film studio in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Naval Yard. Um, and uh, like two sound stages away, they were, uh, they were taping uh, across the universe. So we were we were on that stage and we were working and and I got to, my first chance to actually work for Disney or at least Disney theatricals, um, and and it was it was like like trial by fire. 
um, I'll give you a, a, a couple of highlights of, of the crazy experiences that I had there. Um, I, I was just the music PA. So I'm like transcribing scores and fetching coffee and crazy stuff like that. But uh, uh, because uh, I was, I don't know, so game and interested and excited in the material, I got uh, roped into doing a lot of more creative stuff. So uh, all of the the film score that ended up in the Broadway show, you know, from the from the Tarzan movie, the film score created by Mark Mancina for the film. Anything that is of that score that is ended up in the score is because of me. Uh, I put that stuff together, and you know, when when Phil would say, oh, "I want to use a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and we want to do this," and I'm like, "Okay, got it." And when you say Eric, Phil. You mean sorry, Phil mm-hmm. Collins? Ah, ah. Holy. Oh yeah, he was around all the time. Um, poor guy was going through a divorce at the time, so he was um, very much interested in um, the, the the team and like the having having mates, uh, you know. And he wanted to spend lots of time with us, and his he was very hands on. He was really in, in, interested in the process, um, you know. So he was like. So whereas an other famous composer might, or songwriter, or pop star might um, uh, show up at the beginning of the day, hand a tape to somebody and say, see you next week. Um, no, no, Phil was there every day, all day, sometimes later than, than you know, we'd, we'd dismiss the actors and he would still be there. and He'd still be working on stuff. Uh, so it was, that was a wonderful experience. Um, uh, I, uh, oh, second, Fun, fun tidbit of memory was that uh, there was one time when I actually sat down and um, conducted the show, or at least a, 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 a section of it during tech rehearsals. And, um, and we were actually in the Rogers Theater doing tech, and I was at the podium, and there is, having conducted lots of shows, tons of shows, cannot, nothing can prepare you for what it's like to run a Broadway show. And the conductor of a Broadway show really is the person at the wheel because the stage manager is, is like the chief engineer. The stage manager makes sure everything happens, but he's not actually, he or she is not actually making it happen. Whereas the conductor, you are literally driving the boat. And it was just like that. It was like, I was like sitting at the wheel of an ocean liner. Like if I turn it just a tiny bit this way, the entire show goes that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a big show. Uh, so uh, I'll quickly fast forward through uh, much of the rest of my life. Um, I did a whole bunch of shows after that, a lot of small shows. Um, I, 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 I was working, I'm you know, moving up in the ranks to uh, music supervisor, music preparation copyist, um, all the uh, the writing and arranging I was doing was for smaller stuff, but the the music prep and uh, that kind of uh, uh, detail got orchestration and stuff. Um, that was you know kind of where I was making my money, and I I got to work on Finian's Rainbow, the revival, in two thousand nine, and Rock of Ages, the original production off Broadway, and then moved to Broadway. Um, I I worked for several years for a a, a really awesome off-Broadway theater company that specialized in new plays and musicals called uh, Transport Group. They're wonderful. Um, got to work with my old professor, Michael John, on uh, his, his, uh, his new musical, Queen of the Mist. That was wonderful. Um, so doing a lot of that stuff. And, um, and then writing and arranging and stuff on the side. And um, the, the recession hit me a couple of years later, and I... Works, worked right up and there wasn't anything, I ended up moving back to California uh, where I got to work with these guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, hey, I kind of remember you from back in the day. And we start doing shows again. We start working on stuff. And and um, uh, and so I, I spent some more time out here and I got to uh, got a, uh, conducted a bunch of uh, companies here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and um, and at the there was this this little thing called Facebook. So bring it up to, to Encore. There's a little thing called Facebook. And, uh, uh, and early, on, early on in the Facebook world, there was, a, uh, there was this news group or, or a, a 
uh, fan site uh, of musical theater music directors. And this was a worldwide uh, fan group, people from all over the world getting on here and chatting about shows. It was mostly a place to uh, ask, well, okay, I'm, I've got to do uh, the sound of music, but I don't have a budget for a 30 piece orchestra. What do I do? Uh, there was, you know, like uh, this guitar part. I don't understand what this is supposed to be. It's very obviously not, not actually playable by a guitarist. Does anybody got an idea, you know, and then, you know, to whining about um, copy errors and, and printing errors in scores and, uh, and how, God awful some of the parts that uh, that the rental agencies would send around basically this kind of a forum there's you know it's it's a uh, it's just a, a group of of crazy people who get together and talk about the thing that they love the most uh, and I I was on there I was bored I was lonely and I was frustrated from you know I was you know not conducting as many shows as I wanted so I was on there I was talking telling people about, oh, you, you know, you should do this and you should look at that. And so I got this reputation. People got to know me. Um, and Encore came along because I was engaged in a conversation with someone uh, who was doing Into the Woods. And, uh, and I, was, I was working on a, a crazy idea. It's like, I'm going to write a reduction of Into the Woods down to a really tiny orchestra. Into the Woods is not a large orchestra, but it's, a, it's, a, it's big. There's a lot of pieces. And so I said, I want to reduce this down to something that's going to be manageable for a small group. And, and I got into a conversation with, my, with a, a, a music director by the name of Adam Wachter. Um, and, uh, and, and he was, he was asking me about that. Uh, I'm like rambling a second. I just, I want to, the, the most important thing here for me is I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, naming the players involved correctly. They're, they're super important to me. Um, yeah, all right. Adam Wachter, uh, he's a fantastic uh, person. If you actually watched the show, if you actually watched Encore, this is more for your audience than you guys. You guys, you guys actually watched the show. Uh, he was there a lot. He was conducting a lot of the shows. And, and he, he developed a reputation for being, um, very entertaining to watch. And mm -hmm. the way that he interacted with the performers uh, became uh, really exciting. Um, so I got talking to Adam uh, and he recruited me to use my little reduction of Into the Woods for the Encore pilot, which was going to be Into the Woods. Mm -hmm. And that was done in 2017, 16. That sounds right. It was a way back. It was way back, and and there was there was nothing, no expectation that anything was gonna, like, say no. We might this might go on, but don't hold your breath. And a couple of years later, boom! They said actually we're gonna do a full season, and uh, and I was lucky enough to get the call to basically keep doing what I was doing, just taking these big giant orchestras for these big giant shows and squishing it down to a tiny band. And at the same time, if you've watched the show, I don't know if you can really tell what they're, from what they're, they're describing, but they're not performing the entire show. Mm -hmm. You're only performing a 60 to 90, not even that, like 50 to 60 minute excerpt from the show. So, uh, so not only was I tasked with reducing like a 30 piece orchestra down to eight, but also to take all of the, the, the trims for time and get those into parts so that the, they, they could throw them onto stands and musicians could just play them and it would work in these, in these performances for the taping. Um, I actually got, I, I grabbed a couple of screenshots. There's, there's a couple of places in the episodes. You can actually see my music on the stands. And it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's just like as a, a person who works in the theater and you actually get to see your work on display, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's gratifying. It's like, yes, validation. <laughs> and if we zoom in closely, we can even see your name on the music. Yeah, because I, I, one of the things I learned from, uh, from working with my Broadway uh, friends that uh, you put your name on everything. You put your phone, I mean, like every single piece of music that I worked on has my, my name and my phone number on it. Okay. It's kind of bonkers. Um, 
That's like how you get found, right? At some point, if you actually, if you, if, if, uh, you look through any of the old Rock of Ages scores, chances are you're going to see my company name and my phone number on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. So you got us into uh, Encore. You know, we got some of the history. And I feel like right now is a perfect time for us to do a really quick dance break. What do you guys think? I'm dance good. Up. All right, let's do it. And we're back. So we're, we're here with uh, Mr. Brian Allen Hobbs, uh, as we've learned, uh, from the theater world, um, who has worked on uh, Disney Plus's Encore, and he's here to uh, interview with us and tell us all about his experiences there. And uh, so, so we, before we took our little break there, you, you told us some of your background and you gave us a little walkway into how you uh, lucked out to work on Disney Plus's Encore uh, purely by making yourself known in a Facebook group. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, right? Like, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you have to remember that this that at one at one point in the uh, in the distant past, Facebook was a place where you could go and talk about things that you liked and uh, and share experiences. It it, it wasn't a place to uh, hit uh, your neighbors over the head with political problems. Oh wait, so you're saying there was a time where there there weren't people just criticizing each other? What? No, no, that's always been the case. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, come on! I work in the theater. Yes, yeah. indeed. All right, I used to work in the theater. We're we're, we're still waiting for the theater to actually uh, rise back. from the dead, like uh, like so many Frankenstein's. Yes, indeed. Oh, the, uh, the Phoenix, Phoenixes, Phoenixes. That's see, that's thank you, James. Positive thinking. I call it a zombie, and you call it a phoenix. So, Brian, um, could you do me a favor? Take an episode, any any one of your choosing that you worked on, and walk us through the process from start to finish, what that would look like. Uh, what can I tell you? Um, I can definitely tell you that over the course of the season, this the process from, from start to finish on these episodes, uh, the, the timeline got a lot shorter. Okay. Uh, everything was done uh, super fast. Um, like... The first episode was Annie. Uh, it was the first one they conceived, the first one they planned. They took their time. They planned, We had production meetings. We talked about what the show was going to be, how they were going to cut it down, who they were going to cast. Uh, as you know, that the uh, the way that they cast the shows, they cast uh, major roles from the, the the returners, and then they kind of fill in the rest of the cast with uh, professionals, so that they've mm -hmm. got a full a full show and they don't have to worry about everything. Um, and they did all that in the in one week, uh, in one week of taping. But all of my work, all of the, the prep work, had to be done uh, long in advance. And actually, the first orchestra rehearsal was usually like if they started their first day of auditions on a Sunday, the or first orchestra rehearsal was usually the previous Thursday. Oh, so which means that uh, by that point. By that Thursday, before they start taping, not only does they, do they have to have everything planned, the cuts, um, if they do any, any changes to the music, anything at all, all had to be uh, before then. And then, of course, because everything has to be created, all the, the, the music has to be created, the orchestrations and everything, that's stuff that I was doing, it backed that up a whole bunch more. Um, so for the beginning of the season, um, it was much more relaxed. So I think to orchestrate Annie, I had about four weeks, which is more than enough time. And Annie is a, it's a fairly simple show and fairly straightforward. Um, so it was, it, was a, a, it was easy to reduce it down to figure out all the things and, to, and, a, and also to program uh, the keyboards. Because it was, it was, I think I, I managed to convince them to let me have one super programmed keyboard per show. That's Keyboard programmed keyboards are standard for most musicals, uh, but the smaller the orchestration, the more complex the keyboard programming can get. Um, but I was lucky enough that through, again, through the Facebook group, I met some of the best keyboard programmers pretty much in the world. And um, at, at some, I'm going to, I'm going to plug their, their, them at, uh, uh, at some point here. I want to make sure I do that. But, um, so 
plan the show, plan the cuts, orchestrate the show, how to create everything, make make scores for all the musicians and and send the stuff out to them and uh and they would re they, then i once i emailed all the sh the scores now oh that's the thing this was all done remotely mm -hmm. i was all remote i was here in california and they were you know wherever they were around the country because they would fly into this place and then set up and start doing their pre-production mm -hmm. i would email them scores and then they would start the process of tweaking and fixing and then and the uh and they get their keyboard set up and then they get their programming in and then there's headaches trying to set everything up and get everything going and uh and then then they actually get into the room and they start rehearsing with the with the actors and and then changes start coming and we have a second orchestra rehearsal um halfway through the week and i um some of those orchestra rehears I, they may have taped they may have included some video from some of those orchestra rehearsals i don't remember um i know I got a lot of audio recordings of those sessions. And uh, so you, I get the audio recordings and then I get notes. I'm like, okay, this is what we need to fix. This is what we need to change. This is what's not working. Um, and then, so and then basically then make the changes, everything goes in, they go to production. The whole thing is uh, for one performance, one performance of the show, you know, leading up and they tape it and it's, and that's what you see on the show. Uh, <laughs> As the year went on, this was starting in the in January of 2019. As the year went on, everything started getting faster and faster. And um, one of the things that, that kind of made my life easy is that I didn't have to do this orchestration work for every show, um, only shows with big orchestras. So when they did High School Musical, it's a five-piece band. Mm -hmm. They didn't need me. And there's no no big huge string section to reduce. It's already on a keyboard, so <laughs> they just played out of the original books. Uh, and um, it so, but they would they would they would they their filming schedule started getting really stacked, and they were doing like back to back weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, James. Am I boring you? No, no I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's gone on a little bit long. I can. Um, but basically, just to say that uh, the, as things sped up, things got a little stressed, things got a little crazy. Um, my, you know, four weeks is nice to re orchestrate a show, but that's a luxury. Um, I actually orchestrated Fiddler on the Roof, the Fiddler on the Roof episode, in four days. Whoa. Whoa. What? Whoa. Four days. Did you like, sleep? And that, oh, that, by the way, that's, that's from, uh, you know, actually taking the, 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 the paper scores or a, or a PDF um, all the way to uh, the finished encore paper scores delivered to them. Like they printed them out and it was four days after we started. So did, did they just like email you and say, Hey, Hey Brian, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna do fiddle on the roof here. You, you've got four days or there was no kind of lead like, Hey, we think oh, this we might be coming or. We knew we were going to do Fiddler on the Roof. So um, I got a list of shows at the beginning of the season. And uh, and the first thing I did was um, bring in some help. I got a couple of uh, uh, a couple of orchestrator friends of mine to to come in and, and like pinch it for me. And, and like, so I would, I would like set it up and then send it off to my friend Jordan, who was in Pittsburgh. And, and he, he orchestrated most of Oklahoma. Um, and then I'd get his stuff back and I'm like, okay, fix. And then send it off to them. And, uh, and I had my friend Connor, um, who's in New York, he orchestrated Annie Get Your Gun. Same thing, set it up, sent it off to him, got it back, fixed it, gave it on. Um, and that's what kind of allowed me to, to work uh, back to back and do a whole bunch of shows simultaneously. Um, but they, they were shows that were planned that ended up getting uh, dropped. Like we were gonna, uh, Hairspray was on the first season mm -hmm. and, um, and Les Mis was on the first season. <laughs> Trying to figure out how to take Les Mis and reduce it down to an hour. I dare you. <laughs> I know you have some experience with trying to reduce Les Mis, so. Uh, no, I mean like like cut it down, <laughs> cut the the script down to a. It's a three hour show. Yes. Yeah. No matter how you no matter how you cut it. Because uh, <laughs> it's all music. <laughs> but, but interestingly enough, I, I will actually tell you that uh, the reason that Hairspray was the the reason not Hairspray the reason Les Mis was left off of the season was not because they couldn't figure out how to cut it. Uh, it was because I think it was it was a rights issue. Mm. Uh, 
but um uh, yeah they they uh, uh it, it, i was kind of it was going to be at the end of the season so i was like i was looking forward to it because i really like Les Mis. it's a favorite of mine um so I was looking forward to working on it, but I was dreading it also. Mm-hmm. I figured they're going to, this is going to be really hard and I don't know how they're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you take a hatchet to that show? Yeah. I mean, well, for example, they did uh, the, the, the season finale of Ragtime. Um, mm-hmm. Ragtime's a pretty long and big show with lots of complex stuff. And you kind of, you go into this under, with a plan for, the point of the show. The point of this is the reality TV show. The point of this is the reunion, the the actors. The point of it is not to put on the best possible version of Hairspray. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the things that happened with Ragtime is they basically sacrificed all of one major character, Audra McDonald's material. And she's, she, was, she won a Tony for that role, but they mm-hmm. basically had to cut all of her material out to get the show down uh, to the to a, a a good running time, and and you know if you don't have someone to play that role, then it's the point of it is the reunion, not the show. So it, it's kind of okay. You know, sad for us fans, people who really love the material, but you know you put on the show. Uh, so so like I was making making plans for episodes, and and they were revising the schedule as they went. So, you know, I was, you know, making, doing, I was trying to work as far in advance as I could, but the reason that Fiddler on the Roof was done in four days is because one, uh, I have to wait until they figure out the cut. First of all, they've got to cut the show down so that it'll fit in their runtime. And I can't start working until they tell me what's in and what's not because, and I'll waste my orchestrated entire song that ends up getting cut. Mm -hmm. Uh, And two, they actually moved it. Oh. Ah. They they moved the slot. They moved Fiddler on the Roof up in the schedule, and uh, and so all of a sudden I was like, "Yeah, I got three weeks for Fiddler. I got how long for Fiddler?" <laughs> <laughs> As I said, did you did you sleep? Um, for those four days, not much, <laughs> not much. The nice thing was, I think I got uh, two weeks off after that. There you go. There you go. Hey, hey, Brian. I wanted to know uh, once uh, once you join a Disney production team, is it easier to get on on future projects then? Um, well, having worked on uh, two different Disney projects, I can tell you, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I actually I actively did um, try to get onto uh, the production team for um, either Little Mermaid or Mary Poppins, the, 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 in the theater productions. Right. Um, and, um, and that didn't happen. And I think it has more to do with the, 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 the Disney theatrical um, production office. Um, the, the way the theater works is that uh, they don't necessarily, that, that, Shows don't actually hire people. They don't hire individuals. They hire teams. So uh, if you've worked with these people and these people get hired, you get hired again. Um, you know, they're, they're, the theater is full of um, the, the, the star player, the star person in whatever area, and, uh, and then there's all their people. And they're, they're, you know, when, when they get hired, then they, they like, they find their people and their people get, get the, get to work on it. So, um, so it's a who, you know, thing it's, but it's, it's not just who, you know, because of right. course everything, everything is who, you know, if you think it's not who, you know, uh, then you don't know anyone. Um, <laughs> it's, it's more, you know, what's, what's your, your, your experience, what's your history, what's your connections? Um, okay. who, who did you work with before and, uh, and how often have you worked with them? Okay. Okay. And, and so, oh, go ahead, I, do, Mark. I just want to say, I think that there is a big degree of truth to that. And it's not just in professional theater. I think uh, it, it's oh, yeah. in, in even community oh. theater. I think it's even in the professional work field. I mean, James, how many times have I brought you to work for me uh, at different employers? Yeah. Um, you know, so I think, I think there is a lot of truth to that, that where one person goes, so others go. I see it, you know, working in government now. I, I see, you know, a person gets promoted and uh, to, to a high leadership position and a lot of people get either let go or 
transfer to somewhere else and that person brings in their people. So it, I, I've, I've never heard it said about theater in that way, but it is absolutely true. I mean, I think it was, uh, Brian, you ended up calling me and saying, hey, I need you to come audition for us <laughs> when we did Christmas Carol. You were like, I need you to come audition for this show. And I was like, I didn't plan on it, but okay, I guess that you called me. I'll yeah, show up. Well, it's, um, it's absolutely, and it's it's absolutely the case, and especially in the arts. Well, I, I didn't it, get that phone call, by the way. In the arts... I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna gloss. I'm just gonna <laughs> pave over that comment right there. <laughs> uh, in the arts, where everyone is working in a very volatile environment, where emotions are close to the surface, where you, where people bring their emotions to their art to create, to make their art better, more interesting, engaging, exciting, whatever. You always want to make sure that you've got the best possible people to work with. And it's not just having the person who's best for the job, it's also having the person who's best for the job who also is going to be an ally to you or, or you know, whatever, other people. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons why uh, the recent scandals surrounding um, abuse and bullying in the theater is such a big deal because, um, everyone is is giving so much of themselves and laying themselves a bear to all kinds of uh of, of you know it's it, all kinds of vulnerability it's um it's really difficult to work in the theater um especially if people are not going to be uh, kind and supportive so that's one of the reasons why that's that's a, a big deal um, and so, yeah, like I, I got into a position where I was like, I need a big booming bass voice for this one particular role. So I call the big booming bass voice that I know who's also a great guy, good hang. He's going to bring a lot of joy and fun to my cast. So of course I'm going to call it. Yeah, no, that was a good time. That was a good time. Yeah. So it's good. And, and actually, if you think about it, that reason right there is one of the reasons why uh, the, the encore shows are so wonderful and exciting to watch because you got all these, it's, it's a reunion of those people who, who, who for, you know, a brief moment in their lives shared something amazing and, uh, and, and then it was gone and they're trying to recapture it. They're trying to remember it. And, you know, they take us on the journey. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think the show was a big success and why I really hope that uh, it can continue uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I I actually really enjoyed I really enjoyed those moments when they were like, go back, like just let's all we've been kind of stressed out, so let's go back, let's talk to that high school version of yourself and and stuff like that. I really enjoyed those. Um, so actually, kind of a, a follow up uh, to to the earlier question, um, like as far as the production goes, what was uh, what did you find most enjoyable about doing that? What was like your most enjoyable moment within all that? Well, working on Encore, um, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to pick in enjoyable moments for me because I really was, uh, my involvement was very removed. I was not directly uh, involved in, in most of the production. I think uh, we all had, we had a, a rap party in, in LA and I, I flew down to LA and, uh, and attended this, went to this rap party. And uh, it was actually the first time I had met in person, anyone on the show. <laughs> well, I guess so. Actually, yeah. no, that's not, that's not completely true um, because the, the Sound of Music episode, the one they did in Flint, Michigan, uh, <clears throat> was actually music directed by a, a very dear friend of mine, Carmel Dean, who uh, I went to NYU with. Oh, nice. And, uh, and, and she's, she's a fantastic music director and, and composer. Um, uh, she actually, she was actually the music director for American Idiot. Oh. Uh, and uh, If Then, which is the um, the Brian Yorkie, Tom Kitt musical that started Dina Menzel. Uh, and she was, she got her start uh, as the assistant music director or associate, depending on, I don't remember, on, on Spelling Bee. So 
I know I know important people. So I actually knew Carmel. I I'd like because we went to school together, so we were classmates. Go. Oh, let me drop this name over here. Hold on. <laughs> <sighs> what are you surprised? I was. I mean, how is Carmel Dean is a fantastic person, but to drop that name as compared to you know back in the day when I said Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim uh, ran master classes for, that I attended. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are the kinds of names that cause seismic activity. Oh, yeah, but still, you know. No, no, the point is, here we are uh, 40 minutes into this and still just... <laughs> I've got so many of them. They'll keep coming. All right, so, Brian, I uh, I noticed while watching the show um, that there were, there were times where uh, the songs or the music, uh, it didn't seem to be in the original key. Uh, what's the reason? I, I'd say that... Um, you have kind of an amazing ear if you could catch that kind of detail. Uh, the magic of theater is, and actually it's one of the, one of the things that I always bring to any time I music direct a show, I treat the show I'm working on, whether it's Oklahoma or um, what's something that's really brand new. I don't know. Nothing. When was the last Nothing. I'm trying to think. What was the last show? I worked on? You know what? I worked on uh, a, uh, a a national tour of Evil Dead, the musical. <laughs> that's that's actually it. They were in uh, Chicago, and they were getting ready to go to Seattle last spring, last early last, like in February. And they were in Chicago, and they were going to, and they had to close early because everything had to close. So. Yeah. Um, Evil Dead, there for example. I treat, uh, I would treat Oklahoma the same as I treat Evil Dead. They're not equal, but that's an entirely different argument. Um, I treat every show as though it's brand new. So you want to build the ca- build the, the music to fit the cast that you've got. Uh, as the case was in, with Encore, there were, ca- there were times when, um, oh, perhaps the uh, singers were, you know, not quite so capable as in their old age as they were in their youth. And mm-hmm. so uh, the one way to, uh, to, to, to deal with that, to make people feel a little better about themselves, is to mess with the keys. You, mm-hmm. you alter the, 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 the keys to, 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 suit, to suit your, uh, your, your actors. And, and most, of those, most of those details ended up getting thrown in with the prep for the show, the cutting the, the script down to fit the time limit, cutting the score down, figuring out what, um, who's going who's gonna to sing what. Um, yeah, so like, I think um, there were two or three numbers that had to be transposed in Sound of Music. Um, the, there were a couple of numbers that had to be transposed in Fiddler. Um, Beauty and the Beast. Well, Beauty and the Beast was a very young cast. Um, yeah. So they were, probably one, they were probably like one of the younger casts that they had. Yeah. Actually, I think them in High School Musical might have been like the... The youngest, the youngest. Oh, that would make sense. High School Musical is not that old. Well, no, it, in yeah. the grand scheme of things. Um, but uh, actually, oh, Beauty and the Beast. There was one. Um, it, it was probably a rights issue. Don't quote me on that. They, uh, when I first, the first cut that we did did not include "If I Can't Love Her," the mm-hmm. the Beast Act Act One finale aria. Yeah, and um, that's one. That's a song where they came to me halfway through taping and said, can you please orchestrate this for us? Oh. And I said, for, okay. Hey, yeah. (laughs) Because, well, Beauty and the Beast was one of those. It was a super complex uh, orchestration. It's very detailed. It's very intricate. You remember the movie. It's a huge orchestra. It's very French. Very, lots of, lots of details. And the, and the, uh, the Broadway orchestration does a great job of, of, reducing that down to still a very large orchestra but yeah I, I, but I saw the show i saw the show once uh and and that orchestra was massive yes yeah. and the, the, but the and mti who licenses beauty and the beast to all, all the wherever it gets done has you can do it with a 19 piece orchestra you can do it with 11 piece orchestra uh what we used on encore was smaller than any of those oh, the wow. smallest version of beauty and the beast uh, maybe not Somebody's, I'm sure somebody's done it with like two keyboards and a drum set. Uh, but ours sounded amazing. Oh, it did sound good. It did sound and good. And the reason it sounded amazing was my keyboard programmers. I'm going to take this moment to plug them. Commercial for keyboard tech. Uh, so 
I I met a, an amazing guy named Kevin Rowland on on the Facebook group chatting and he was moving to, to California and getting into music directing and we were chatting and he programmed my production of Pippin. I was doing a production of Pippin and he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And I got to know him and he was, uh, he's this, is a brilliant or, um, music director, orchestrator, pianist, um, and, uh, and an absolute whiz at um, music tech. Uh, and so he, he's, he's gotten into keyboard programming, which is, you know, basically taking your, your standard keyboard and arranging it so that uh, there, there are different sounds that you don't have live instruments for. So you've got a string patch, and you've got a, a funny keyboard patch. You've got a piano, and then you've got a, a, a like a, a harp, programmed harp gliss, um, and layering all that stuff together into a sequence so that a person in the pit with a keyboard can just play, hit a button, and it's the next sound, and the next sound, and the next sound, and the next sound. And, um, and that's kind of how we cheat and make uh, tiny orchestras sound full and lush and beautiful. And, uh, oh. and those guys, so I got to know Kevin and he became a dear friend and, and he's a fantastic, fantastic guy to hang out with. Um, we, we, we sit and, uh, and catch up on old times and kibitz and, and, and complain about, uh, you know, bad shows and it's fun. Um, uh, but he got together with uh, two other guys, a guy named Taylor Williams and a guy named Ethan um, Deppy. Ethan is based in Chicago. Taylor is based in New York. And all three of them, I actually got to work with all three of them on different episodes of uh, Encore. Kevin programmed most of the shows. Ethan programmed Annie. And Taylor was going to program uh, Ragtime. That's the different, that's different. Ragtime was a different, a different story. Um, but, um, and I, the, the, sh my work could not have happened without them. Uh, and what they've been, what they've done since is they've formed their, a new, uh, company called keyboard tech and you can rent their programming from MTI directly. Oh, nice. So they, they worked out a deal with MTI and I think they're actually working with Concord also. It's another place that rents shows. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can get these, like, it's top of the notch. Yeah. Top of the line, brilliant, um, A-level professional uh, programming for your shows in your tiny little uh, community theater, your high school, your middle school, whatever. And you can, you can get uh, professional grade keyboard sounds for your shows. And, uh, and because they're partnered with the rental agencies, it's really easy to, to get there, to get that, that set up for them. Uh, but yeah, so they, they, they didn't incorporate until after Encore. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that I set them up. They were already like, like because of this, this community, of people all coming together. Um, I got to know every single one of them individually. But, uh, but they're wonderful. They're fantastic guys. It's a great example of bringing people to work on your, your, your thing who are uh, the best in the business and also great guys and great friends. All right. All right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, real quick, Brian. So, yeah. uh, look, what's up with season two? Is it happening? And are you going to be involved with it? What's the deal? I, what can I tell you about season two? Um, I am fairly certain, like in the 80 to 90% certain that it's going to happen. Um, obviously, it can't happen as long as there's right. a pandemic because the whole point of it is getting together in a room and sharing a space together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's sort of important. But I have been talking with Adam, and Adam has been talking with Koi, and uh, the, the producers have been talking amongst themselves, and I will probably be the last person to know. Wow. So as soon as, soon as you know, let us know. <laughs> yes, please. Let us be the last to know. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I would probably know uh, maybe about half a second before uh, the, the, the trailer drops or uh, something like that, you know? <laughs> because All what's right. going to happen is they're going to, because then they've got to plan the whole thing. And then I've got to set, set up all that, you know, set aside all that time in my life to, uh, to get everything ready. No, that's not true. Actually, um, because of all the shows that did not make it into season one, oh, I have man. a list of shows that that are like high up on their 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 uh, their the shows they want to do. 
so I've, I've kind of been, you know, keeping an eye on them, working on them a little bit, thinking about them a little bit, you know, just in case. We got we got a Bye Bye Birdie in there. We got a Music Man in there. Hairspray, because, you know, they wanted to do Hairspray, but it, they weren't able to get it into season one. Yeah. Well, Planning and prepping and scheming. There you go. You know, it's, it's sort of like I can, can do, more, do more with less time, which is sort of the, the, the name of the game these days. There well, you go. Brian, uh, I want to thank you for joining us here on the Fat and Black Connection. Um, Mr. Brian Allen Hobbs, everyone, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I like you guys. It's good. Yeah. Yes, hey, please. Hey, hey, hey look, I'm gonna, you, you got to come back, bro. You got to come back. You're too fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely want to have you back at some point. I want to hear some more stories about Broadway, and uh, I think you've I think you've got a lot of stories to tell, and so um, I think we will have you back. Um, but you know, thank you for joining us. Uh, please, oh, yeah. please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you missed any of the conversation, uh, go back, re-listen to this broadcast starting just a few hours via Anchor, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Google. Uh, radio public we're everywhere man and we're everywhere. everywhere and later this week you should be able to see this youtube video uh we'll make that available and uh yeah just uh thank you brian and uh i hope everybody has a good rest of their week and uh we will talk to you all soon thanks brian happy tuesday everybody get your vaccine <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs>